Week 5, Lesson 2, Romance Comics For whatever reason, superheroes were failing to sell after World War II, but that doesn't mean that comics were struggling. In fact, the individual comic pamphlets were selling so well that they began to catch the public's eye. According to one source, one in three periodicals sold in 1947 was a comic book. Now, periodicals include magazines and newspapers, so for roughly every newspaper and magazine sold, a comic was sold as well. This meant that comics were becoming an accepted medium in America. And not just one for young boys, but a medium that could sell to young girls, women, and men. They were still a relatively new medium compared to magazines and newspapers, but were quickly gaining credibility. One demographic that was largely ignored by the comic book industry was girls and young women. With superheroes who were acting as personifications of male power fantasies proving to constantly have adequate sales, there wasn't really any immediate necessity for publishers to balance out their genres in self-slice-of-life comics, romance comics, fashion comics, or other comics that were target the female demographic. But there was one company who thought that the superhero craze would just be a fad. Morris Cohen, Louis Silverkeet, and John L. Goldwater were some entrepreneurs that got together to form MLJ magazines, with their initials of their first names coming together to create the company's name. These were the guys who brought us the shield in prep comics a few months before Captain America would take the inspiration from the design. They were able to realize that superheroes wouldn't dominate the medium forever and start to explore other genres. Remember how Action Comics and Detective Comics were anthology magazines? They'd mostly have the same genre or themes, but they could experiment and do a humor comic every now and then. Well, Pep Comics experimented with some humor comics until it came across one that seemed to be successful. Pep Comics issue number 22 had a backup issue about a boy trying to impress a girl next door. That boy's name was Archie Andrews, but his friends just called him Chick. In the first Archie story, we're introduced to Archie Andrews, his neighbor, Betty Cooper, and his best friend, Jughead Jones. All their personalities here are very similar to how we know them today. The biggest change here seems to be the character models. Archie is drawn much smaller and younger looking here than he was in future comics. Usually, he's drawn as a teenager between the ages of 14 to 16, but here he looks like he's supposed to be 10 to 12. As can be expected for a humor comic, Archie's attempts to win the attention of the girl next door don't go as planned and create slapstick complications for everyone. Archie got a positive enough reception from readers that he seemed to get his own series. The series was such a success that in 1946, MLJ Magazine changed her name to Archie, and in 1947, Archie Comics retired their superheroes and focused on Archie and similar characters. Well, Archie was primarily a comedic magazine, everything Archie did was to get the attention of girls. Other publishers picked up on this and tried their hand at writing romance series. Even Timely tried their hand at this in 1945 with Millie the Model. But, the first real success in romance comics seemed to be Young Romance by Prize Comics. Young Romance was a series created by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, the same guys who created Captain America. After the war, when superheroes fell from favor, they weren't getting as much work. After a failed attempt, they decided to base their comic stories off of True Love Confessions magazine, and it turned out that that trick worked. Young Romance was a huge seller, and like Superman's success, this one was met with dozens and dozens of imitators, with mixed results. In fact, the romance comics targeting girls were so successful that according to one source between 1948 and 1949, over a quarter of comics being published were romance comics. Not only that, but New Steeler magazine showed a graph from the time which suggests that the girls from the ages of 17 to 25 were reading more comics than the boys in the same age group. This was huge. If you think about what we've gone over this course so far, we've looked at one female creator and a handful of female characters, including Little Orphan Annie and Wonder Woman, both of which, if rumors are to be believed, were originally supposed to be male characters. This was an opening for more female writers and artists to get involved in the industry, which 
didn't happen. The vast, and I mean vast majority of writers and comic artists working in romance comics were men. I'm talking 95 to 99% men. Sometimes there would be an advice columns where girls would write about their romantic problems. This one is Nancy Hale's advice column. Nancy Hale was a real woman who wrote about women's issues at the time, but when I looked up her bibliography and biography, I could find nothing about her working in comics. This means that Young Romance probably licensed her name and likeness to tell these stories, and she was in no way directly involved with them. Meaning one of two things. One, that these letters and replies were taken from elsewhere, or possibly number two, that the male staff answered these questions under her name. I could not find a definitive answer for either possibility. But let's take a quick look at a random romance comic to see what was going on. This was an issue from Young Love, a series which was published less than two years after Young Romance was such a huge success. Young Love, issue number four. The first thing that we should notice about this cover is that it isn't an illustration, but a photograph of a young woman. Her name is Joy Lansing, and she is a young star at MGM Studios in the late 1940s and 1950s. The price is still 10 cents. That's the same price Action Comics was over a decade earlier. And the cover claims that this issue holds 52 pages of real-life comics. And what does it mean, real-life comics? Are the comics all based on true stories? Or do they all take place in a world without the fantastical? Either way, this is an example of comics trying to legitimize themselves again, saying what people read here is relevant to the real world. This is just another attempt by comics trying to justify that the medium is relevant. At the bottom left corner, there is a quote. I saw Johnny and fell in love. But Johnny was an honorable man, and I was his best friend's sweetheart. Shocking, ladies and gentlemen, what will our young woman do? I guess you'll just have to fork over 10 cents to find out. When we actually open the book, the first thing we see is an ad for weight loss. And if you read the whole book, you'd find that all the ads in it target girls who are trying to look more adult. The next page is a splash page by Jack Kirby about a woman who lost her husband in the war. In the bottom panels, we find out that she is living with her in-laws when she gets news of his death. The in-laws let her stay and try and make her happy. However, she's still a young, beautiful woman and fully able to produce children. She finds out that she's attracted to another war veteran, who is a 26-year-old advertiser. But if we look at the page here, the first thing you should notice is all the words. I would say that roughly 50% of this page is covered in dialog boxes and word bubbles. There is a lot of reading going on here. So much that if you took out all the pictures, you could still understand exactly what's going on. The point being that there isn't much action happening. Looking carefully at the pictures, you can see that the two characters are looking around for a bit and then drive off to the final panel. But nothing here needs to be illustrated to get this point across. This could easily be done in prose and take just as long to read. Of course, the woman falls in love and wants to marry the veteran. She tells her in-laws, and the mother-in-law freaks out and tells her to leave the house. But it turns out the father-in-law understands her situation and wants her to be happy. The story just ends with the woman and her fiancé leaving her in-laws' house for a new life. That's it. There's no conclusion with the mother. We don't see if the marriage lasts or not. This story is never revisited. Most stories in these magazines would never last full issue and would almost never continue into the next issue. They were short stories about romantic relationships and girls seemed to love them. Now, that one story we looked at was surprisingly mature for a romance comic at this time. There were also stories that just taught girls to ignore their attractions to the bad boy and stick with the boy next door type, who is a hard-working American with morals who didn't get drunk. And, if he was lucky, that boy would have a future working in the comic book industry.
Looking back at these stories, it seems that in most of them, the solution for the woman's problems is finding a man that's right for her and letting him take care of her. These stories support a very paternal society and seem to promote that women were just happy being housewives. But remember, these were comics from the late 40s and early 50s. What they were promoting was what writers thought girls wanted to read. And it wasn't just in comics. The overwhelming portrayal of women in media was telling everyone that women wanted to have a housewife lifestyle. Despite the controversy, which we'll look at in a later video, Young Love would remain a periodical from 1947 until 1977, being published by three different companies, Crestwood Comics, Prize Comics, and DC Comics. Some other romance comics of note include Archie Comics, which has been published constantly from 1941 and is still going strong today. Billy the Model from Timely and later Marvel Comics, which was published from 1945 to 1973. Young Romance by Prize and later Crestwood Publishing was published from 1947 to 1975. Superman's girlfriend, Lois Lane, that was the name of her comic, non-official description of the character, was published by DC Comics from 1958 to 1974. Teen Confession by Charleston Comics was published from 1959 to 1976. But, as we're going to see, romance was just one of the three big genres popping up and filling in the market after the superhero sales plummeted. And, it was probably the tamest of the three, but even these comics had their critics. So, why are romance comics important to this course? Because they showed that girls and young women were willing to read comics. They showed that comics could take on a more mature subject and still find readers. Also, despite the large demographic for females that were buying comic books, the industry was still heavily dominated by male writers and artists. Questions to contemplate. Why do we see many modern romance comics in comic book stores today? What are some of the problems of exclusively letting a group of men in their late 20s to mid 30s give dating and love advice to teenage girls? Most of the romance comics listed stopped being published in the mid-1970s. Why do you think this happened? <laughs> 